Hi, welcome to this week's Massey Dialogues at, at Massey College and the University of Toronto. The Massey Dialogues are designed to embrace uh, the essence of our college and community. They're to be, we hope, uh, a highly informed, intergenerational, interdisciplinary, and intercultural discourse to serve the public good and to explain the country and, to the, and the world. Um, my name is Michael Valpe. I'm a senior fellow at Massey. And for the next hour, I'll be host of the first of this week's sessions. We're going to travel up to the Arctic to connect with our guest, uh, Dr. Gwen Healy Akiaruk, who is a Massey alumna. Gwen was born and raised in the Kaluit. She holds an undergraduate degree in physics from Queen's University. Uh, a master's degree in epidemiology uh, from University of Calgary, and a doctorate in public health from University of Toronto's Dalalana School. And to give you a feel as to how far we are from downtown Toronto, you'll likely be noticing about a five-second delay in our conversation. Um, we, we plan to go for about an hour, and the topic of our conversation is uh, Nunavut, Canada without COVID, which is what Nunavut is, the only jurisdiction in Canada where the coronavirus hasn't struck. Um, Gwen is co-founder and, and executive and scientific director of Kaliji Arkti Health Research Centre, which is structured to include to involve northerners in northern health research and since its founding in 2006 has engaged more than a, th a thousand uh, people in the territory and partnering on or participating in research papers and training workshops in Nunavut related to community health. Um, after my conversation with Gwen We'll go first to junior fellow Rachel Lee, who is a master's student in public health at Dalalana School. And then to our commentator, Sarah Rogers, a journalism this, uh, fellow this year at Massey, who most recently in her 13-year career in community journalism has worked as a reporter for the Akalawit-based uh, Nunatsiak News, all of which will leave us 15 to 20 minutes to take questions from you and the viewing audience who are plugged in uh, via YouTube and can interact with the dialogue via the chat function. So Gwen, I'm hoping you'll talk to us about uh, what the pandemic or the, and I saw you smiling by the way when I pronounced the, the name of your research center, so I'm not quite there yet. Uh, I hope you'll talk to us about what the pandemic or the absence of pandemic looks like on the ground. And if I understand correctly, none of it is pretty much sealed off to non-residents. Entry by sea is closed. I don't think entry by road is possible at any time. And entry by air is limited to four airports and uh, two-week quarantines before departure. Can you, can you talk to us about how the territory's people have respond to this, responded to this and more specifically, how effective the territorial government and organizations such as yours have been in getting information about the temp pandemic into the community? Sure. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. First of all, for the invitation to participate um, in this discussion, in this dialogue, and uh, and thank you for these um, for these questions. So, I guess um, I guess the first question is, you know, how how have we all been responding to the pandemic? And I have to say that I am so proud of our communities in that our response is primarily rooted in kindness and compassion. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yep. I'm still yep. connected. Okay. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, you know, where we've all been taking very good care of each other, you know, buying groceries and sharing food. And, you know, my children and I were bringing um, seal meat to elders this morning and, um, you know, just making sure everyone um, has what they need. And, uh, you know, and our stores and local businesses have been doing the same. So it's very heartwarming um, to know that 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 is how um, we take care of each other in an emergency. Um, and as you said, the uh, we've we've been under travel restrictions for um, for well over a month now. And um, for for our part, uh, I can explain a little bit about what our center's thinking is or has been around this. Where we we um, at Kali Gelti um, grounded research from our organization um, on March twelfth. So five or six days before even the territory um, enacted the travel restrictions. And so be because we felt that it was very important not to be um, putting our staff or our, or our communities in a situation where we would be bringing the illness to our communities. We wanted to be responsible in, in sort of taking some leadership around preventing that from happening. And, and around the same time, other, you know, community organizations and community members had also been suggesting travel restrictions. And then, um, you know, they came into place a few days later. So, you know, at that time, people had been asking for them. And, um, and I think when they went into place, there was um, a sense of relief for many people, but also recognizing that there's a lot of logistics involved in bringing our students back, for example, from the South. We, you know, many of our post-secondary students pursue educational opportunities in the South and, you know, people who are traveling on for medical purposes and um, seeking care that is provided outside the territory, you know, a significant amount of time and resources has been put in to um, making sure people have pathways to get back home. Um, but for the most part, I think once um, the travel restrictions went into place and, um, uh, you know, people were following isolation protocols, uh, at first, and then, you know, it transferred to having um, the quarantine take place, uh, you know, at designated centers in the south. Um, there was quite a sense of, of relief that the illness, that COVID-19 hadn't come here um, after several weeks. So it's, it's tremendous because we have such a vulnerable population. We are so lucky and we're, I think we're all very grateful that it hasn't come here. It was a very big fear, for sure, in our communities, where we have um, uh, very high rates of respiratory illness. Um, you know, we have high rates of medevac, med medical evacuation for respiratory illness, especially among children. So we we really want to make sure that our vulnerable populations don't get sick. So. So, so far, so far, so good. I don't want to jinx it. I should knock on something. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was listening to um, your chief public health officer at the press conference yesterday. I was listening to the press conference on CBC Nunavut. And he was saying that mm -hmm. half the, the medevac operations have been cut by half and that respiratory, respiratory infections have been cut by half, which, which has, I gather, been a great source of relief uh, to health care givers in, in the territory. Why have, those, why have those percentages dropped so dramatically? Well, our, you know, our understanding and our, uh, our best guess, uh, our best assumption right now would be that because everybody's doing a very good job of following the social distancing recommendations. So there's less transmission of those uh, viruses, like, like, like uh, TB, you know, like influenza. Yeah, like, well, like influenza and respiratory, so, sorry, the influenza and the respiratory syncytial virus are two of the biggest ones at this time of year. And so the transmission of illnesses like that, which are, of course, um, on top of tuberculosis, uh, highly problematic. So um, it's, it shows that we're doing really well with the social and physical distancing, which is, which is great. I, I know so little about Dunavut, 
that I, you know, the image in my mind is just of vast areas of snow and, and nothing moving. Um, how easy has it been to get the message about distancing and um, other forms of public health? How, how difficult has it been to get that message out to the community? Well, we have our own radio stations. So we have CBC Nunavut, which you were listening to. And um, for decades, they've, they have a morning show called Kudli. And um, uh, that's where I get my information. <laughs> I'm not a big social media user, but I listen to the radio every morning. And, um, and, and, and then within each community, they have community radio stations. So actually, radio is a huge... Um, is a huge communication tool here uh, that's still uh, in use. And then um, quite a number of, you know, all the live, the Facebook live feeds of the, they were doing daily press conferences for a while. Now they're doing um, three times a week, the um, broadcasted um, press conferences with the premier and the, and Dr. Michael Patterson, the chief public health officer. So, um, so I, there's a diversity of strategies I think they're trying to use that, uh, as far as I can tell, have been quite effective um, in communicating information to people in both English and Inuktitut. Can you, can you practice distancing in small, small communities that are, that are so small? I mean, is, is community isolation possible? I think so. Some of the areas where we know it's challenging um, include, you know, like our high, our high rates of overcrowding, where um, where we have a number of individuals living in smaller homes, and in those situations, um, definitely social and physical distancing would be a challenge. And then, in addition. Um, the demand on the shelters, which we're trying to assess right now, so I don't have any data on it at the moment. But one of the one of the areas our center is trying to work on is is sort of assess needs um, uh, in our shelter system. Um, those are are challenging areas, but they you know everybody has been working hard to implement the sanitizing protocols that are recommended and the guidelines that have been put forth by the federal government um, for shelter, for example. Um, and then the, the, the great thing, you know, for us is that we have this, as you say, wide open space uh, and we can get outside and go on the land. So a number of people have been, you know, uh, sheltering at cabins and, um, you know, spaces out on the land and, um, you know, if if this had been happening in December and January when it was dark and minus 50 degrees Celsius, you know, it would have been a different situation. But it's spring here. You know, we have here in Halloween, we have 20 hours of sunlight a day. And in the high Arctic, it's more, um, you know, they already have 24 hours of daylight uh, in some places. And so it's wonderful and possible for us to be to be outside on the land, myself included, right? I have this tan the northern tan from here to here from being out on the on the land and out on the sea ice <laughs> um, well, who, who are the dominant populations in the shelters Gwen? um in terms of gender or age or sort of uh, well, uh, de demographics generally uh, are these people sheltering from some kind of uh, I don't know whether this is an easy question to ask, but from some kind of abuse or or uh, or what? Well, there are five. We have five shelters in the territory for um, yes, for domestic um, abuse for women and children, and then there are shelters as well for uh, homeless, the homeless population. Um, and I I don't have any more demographic information than that, other yeah. than. You know, in Nikhalavi, we there's a designated homeless shelter for men and another one for women. So they are different buildings. How can how can you be homeless in Nunavut? It means that, I mean, it means that you really don't have any family connections. Is, is homelessness a significant issue? 
Well, there, there's there been different studies of homelessness or even just trying to quantify, as you say, it's how can you be homeless when we have such an extraordinarily, um, you know, challenging environment in terms of weather and temperature um, that a number of studies have tried to quantify it. But it's, you know, I guess some of the key factors are whether people have to do with mobility. You know, if if people have come to Echelouit, for example, for medical reasons and then didn't return back home, if they came for school or or uh, were engaged in the justice system for some reason and and didn't go back home, then, you know, then they're here and, and they have nowhere to live. Um, compounded by the fact that, you know, there is a crowding pro- problem in the territory, which means there, there aren't enough units uh, for people to live in. And so, um, you know, there have been significant investments over the years in trying to alleviate that, that crowding problem, um, which we're still waiting to see the results of. I have a couple of more questions, and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn the conversation over to Rachel. Um, when you and I spoke uh, a few days ago, you said something, you said that um, with the temperature warming and the children going out to play, that this was an added concern for you as, as, uh, as a community health expert. How do you keep, if, if you've had children sort of basically locked down for weeks, uh, how can you keep them away from each other uh, once the weather is warm enough for them to go outside? Well, I, I guess that's that's one of the challenges that we're facing now. And, uh, you know, we've seen, I mean, I've observed community members just saying, you know, you guys are supposed to be apart, you know, you can say hi to each other and, you know, you can play on the same hill of snow, but you have to keep a bit of a distance. And I think um, one of my other observations was that, you know, normally at this time of year, because we have so much daylight, you know, all the the teenagers like to get out and walk around in groups with their friends and, you know, and instead of, you know, six or seven or eight, you know, I'll, you'll see two or three. So <laughs> they're 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 um, m- making smaller their little groups uh, to walk around town. So I, I guess there's um, it's a bit of a challenge for everybody that yeah. we're all trying to navigate. Yeah. Have you have you done all the right things? The government, uh, public health officials. Have you? I mean, is, are the things that you would like to see being done and, and haven't been done? Or how, how satisfied are you with what has been done? And are you surprised, by the way, that the infection hasn't taken root in the territory? I, yes, well, I guess I was surprised. Um, in the first few weeks where our numbers were consistently zero, um, I think I was surprised because Ottawa is um, one of our gateway cities for here in Chaluit, and and the infection was just you know proliferating in Ottawa. And you know we have um, a percentage of our population that are transient workers, and they're going through the airport, and they're going through the cities, and and uh, you know it just seemed like. Um, it just seemed highly probable that it would it would come here, but clearly our protocols um, were put in place at the right time, and you know people really followed the the isolation guidelines when they did get here, and so I, we have nothing but gratitude, I think, for for everybody's hard work in making that happen. Yeah, you you pay a lot of attention to the rest of what's going on around the Arctic Circle. Is Nunavut doing better than other jurisdictions? Well, I think Greenland implemented similar travel restrictions. There's no but, but I travel noticed between them. They've had one oh, case. Yes. They've had yes, one. Yes, they did. Yeah. And then and then no more since then. And and the NWT as well, I guess they you know, they had a, a handful of cases and then uh, and then no more since then as well. Um, I, I understand in Nunavik that the 
Um, the cases continued to slowly increase there. And, uh, and in Nunatsia, with the last I checked, uh, they had no cases. So, um, so I think, you know, I think, I mean, part of, I think part of the, you know, one of the areas of discussion has been around when each province or territory had spring break <laughs> planned, um, you know, where Quebec had had spring break much earlier, you know, ours was just April 4th to, you know, April 20th uh, on the calendar. So, um, you know, they, they, they have a bit of a slightly different situation in Quebec where they had so much travel um, right in that time period. I'm going to I'm going to turn the conversation over to Rachel Lee, who is studying at Dalalama School, specializing in, in health injustices uh, related to the social determinants of health and how to enact systems oriented public health interventions uh, rooted in anti oppression and decolonization. Uh, she's a graduate of UBC in sociology and was co-editor-in-chief of Sojourners, which was the first uh, undergraduate journal of sociology in North America. Um, and she's been an avid volunteer in organizations that she's passionate about, including uh, harm reduction services and youth. So Rachel, the floor is yours and uh, you're on. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, thank you both for the conversation. It was it was really good to hear about what's going on um, in the north. I, it's rare that we hear about hear about the news, and and it's really awesome that there have been no cases so far. Like it's very exciting. <laughs> Hope it stays that way, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned some good points about um, um, certain risk factors or or um, demographics that make you more at risk for COVID, for instance, or other diseases. Um, and that would be things like transient uh, or your labor, um, transient workers or um, homelessness, overcrowding. Um, and I, yeah, and I just, that definitely relates to the work that I do um, in my MPH right now. So I just want to echo um, the importance of, um, yeah, I guess, uh, putting em emphasis on who is getting left behind or not included in, in sort of the policies and interventions that we put forth um, as as society as a society in in Canada. So yeah, thank you for talking a little bit about that. Um, I was looking at your website of the Kwaiu Gyakti Research Center and looking a little bit about looking at a little bit about what your research um, interests have been. Um, and, and I want to ask a specific question about um, the Indigenous research methodologies and uh, that are rooted in Indigenous epistemologies and ways of knowing. And I'm wondering how this aspect of your work and research really relates to the current measures put forth in, in various levels of the government. And um, more specifically, do you see any shortcomings in the current public health or um, it could be public health or social, economic or medical responses? Um, to COVID-19 that could could have been addressed better or could have been improved with the use of Indigenous epistemologies and, and frameworks. And um, I think one great example is is the Pil Piliricatiinic model that I saw on your website um, that really uh, centers communities um, and, and groups of people at the center, whereas I think um, many, many common public health models um, look at individuals at the center and then kind of branch out for um, from there. So, yeah, sorry, that's a long question, <laughs> but that's one of the burning questions I had knowing your research interests. Sure. Okay. Thank you for the question. And how how delightful that you had a look at our community health research model. Thank you for 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 doing that. Um, yes. Um, I, I guess um, one of the things we talk about in our work at Kavigalti, and you know, because our center is an independent, community-led research center, you know, our grounding is is in our communities and in what's happening, um, you know, for children and families and community members throughout the territory. And one of the ways we 
think about and talk about health in our work and in our communities is, like you said, where um, where public health will often fo- focus on on individual health, and where we reside is when we're is in a space where we're talking about our collective health and well-being, and so you know, um, so if if our communities are not well, you know, I am not well, and and vice versa. If I'm not well, then my community is not well, and that's that's where um, you know that's where our interventions reside. I guess is in that space, and and by further extension, you know, if our land is not well and our waters are not well, then we're not well either, um, because we you know we rely you know we rely on all these spaces for our food and for, you know, as part of spirituality and as part of, you know, sort of grounding as humans is there's a very intimate um, interaction there in our communities. And so, um, and so is, it, it is an inuptitut word, which means we're all working for the common good. And so to answer your question, you know, our public health measures that, you know, we are enacting as community members um, involve you know, bringing food to our elders, you know, and families and single parents and, you know, people who are in quarantine and who, who need extra help. You know, it has involved people setting up Skype um, arrangements for the elders facility, you know, <laughs> trying to mm-hmm. find ways to help elders connect with their with their families when they, um, you know, are, are needing to stay home and um, because there are brain trusts right? So, you know, they're part of our collective well-being. Our vulnerable populations and our mm-hmm. families are part of our collective well-being. Um, you know, and for our elders, they they hold the collective knowledge and wisdom of society. So I, I think that everyone that I have engaged with in this time has been thinking about that and talking about that. Like, what are we doing? And are we doing enough as community members to help facilitate everyone to be well. Um, so it's, you know, it's been critically important for everyone to do that. And that's certainly what I've seen, just a lot of, a lot of compassion and kindness and generosity. It's, it's so, it's so wonderful, I have to say, because, um, you know, in Nunavut, we're sort of vulnerable to this, this dominant narrative about how poor we, we rank on so many indicators that we're actually doing so well here. I want everybody to mark down this sort of six week period in history where we are excelling and remember it because, you know, it's actually those values that are at the heart of our communities that are allowing us to to excel in this area, I, I think. That's my personal observation. Um, just, I hope that was probably a long rambling answer to your question. No, no, it was really, it was, it's great. Yeah, no, and I, Totally agree with you. Like, there's, I think, something about um, when we switch our thinking to um, from protecting just myself, or, or you know, not not spreading it to others, just by through myself, like moving on from this focus on individuals to um, thinking about collectives as a unit of um, a unit of analysis, but unit of um, um, health in general and, and moving beyond the individual, I think that has a, has a tremendous impact on how effective uh, mitigation measures can be. Um, just the same kind of social distancing measures, whether it be taking care of um, others in the community, like the, the responses, I, I feel like the effectiveness really depends heavily on, on the community's understanding of um, the unit and and I, and I really appreciate that model. Just looking at it, um, centering the communities in the in the middle and at the core of it all. I, I thought that was very very important. Um, I don't know how much time I have to ask questions, but Michael, I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, you have a cut. You have a couple of minutes. Go right ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, while you're just uh, putting your thoughts together, something occurred to me, Gwen. Do you actually have residences for the elderly in in Nunavut, or is that a southern concept? Um, 
Yes, there are care facilities. And then, you know, here in Ahalui, we have an elders residence. You know, it's a series of apartments and, and, a, and a common gathering space and things like that. Um, but um, there are a number of our elders who are um, needing to reside in the south. And, you know, there's been significant move, movement and work and I think policy development to help um, bring them home. Yeah. Go ahead, Rachel. Um, okay, yeah. So I think one question I had was also just regarding your work and how um, how COVID has changed your current work aside from, I mean, maybe having not to travel or um, not going into work physically, but also how you see your work in, in teaching and, and the research and evaluation work that you do um, changed or changing, transformed, or even um, maybe solidified or strengthened um, by the experience of this pandemic? Um. Okay, that's a great question, Rachel. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, so we face all the same realities as everyone else, you know, working by distance and working remotely and from home. Actually, I'm, I'm in my office at the moment, but... <laughs> Um, we ha it has the best internet connection. So that's so that's really the critical thing. Is it seems at this time everybody's moving on, you know, online, you know, to delivering courses online, connecting online, holding meetings online, and we have very underdeveloped internet infrastructure in Nunavut, and that you know it's it's a systemic problem right across the territory is the underinvestment in our internet infrastructure, number one, to even sustain this. And then and then two is is who has access to the internet in our territory. And and so, you know, we've we were just actually having this discussion among our staff yesterday is sort of trying to, you know, prioritize what uh, elements of our courses we we try to develop into an online platform and how maybe we you know move some of our research into survey based research but but we we recognize that we're missing a significant portion of our population when we do that and so it does impact our work we are very community based you know our our courses and workshops are accessible to everyone you know we're we're usually in schools and we, you know, we have a philosophy where if you're interested in, in research and if you're interested in, in this health or well-being topic that we're working in, you are absolutely welcome to come. You know, all, all you need to participate in the work that we do is, is to be heart-centered and to, to be community-minded and passionate about whatever it is, you know, the topic is. And so that, you know, that eliminates a number of, of barriers for people and and unfortunately with this situation those barriers are back up because because of the reliance i guess on on the internet so so yeah we're we were just talking about this yesterday and we're trying to find our path forward <laughs> in the um in the new in the new reality um even how we take kids out on the land you know how you know are there safe ways to to take a group of young people out on the land, you know, we normally have a you know a tent space set up at the at the river here in Khalid, um, you know, as our our remote uh, office and um, you know a training area, and and we're not sure if we can do that. Like those areas are all closed, and you know how how we how we pivot, I suppose. Um, so yes, definitely, we're feeling we're feeling the impact. Um, uh, in terms of our normal processes and our, you know, our community-based, um, you know, strength-based approaches are, are compromised when, when we can't see and talk to each other <laughs> and be around each other. Yeah. Sarah, it's you. Hello. Nice to be here. Um, and I think this is a really um, important conversation for um, sort of Southern Canada to hear, assuming that they make up a lot of um, people that are tuning in right now. Um, I should mention that I'm not working or reporting on this right now, but um, just to pick up on a, a few points that Gwen had made, I was also really, really concerned, um, 
you know, back in March about the potential impact COVID could have on northern communities. Um, and I, I really have to commend Nunavut. It's done an excellent job um, at keeping people safe. And that's the public and the compassion piece, I think you were talking about, Gwen, and also the, the government's response. Um, really impressed with the daily press briefings that they've done, if I can say so as a journalist. I think uh, I've heard a lot of people say that they're really uh, happy with um, the uh, the territory's chief public health officer and how he's made himself available um, through these daily um, briefings that they do in English, Annie Nuktutut. I think the media coverage of this pandemic has really benefited from having that kind of access. Um, to health authorities and government officials um, and I mean selfishly I kind of hope to see something like this continue. I don't want the pandemic to last for months but I just think of all the other issues that uh, we cover across the north and the challenges we face with there being so many uh, remote communities. Um, I think anyway that those those daily briefings have really, um, you can see the benefit of that in, in the reporting that we've seen. Um, Listening to Gwen, also one thing that that you know really struck me was, um, uh, she, you know, she was talking about um, some of the the health issues behind this, and I think one thing that um, really needs to be emphasized in this discussion is how much we need to recognize housing and the availability of housing um, as part of the provision of healthcare in Nunavut and other northern communities. I know that's not just the case in the north, but I mean, if we look at I'm not entirely sure what the latest stats are, but I think the latest I read was that 54% of Nunavumiat live in overcrowded conditions. Um, and then we look also too at the legacy of respiratory illness um, in the <coughs> Inuit communities. Um, I think in one of the first Massey dialogues uh, a few weeks ago, I think it was Bob Ray that was talking about really the notion of pandemic, how key that that was and that is to um, colonialism in Canada. We also had, um, we had Inuit Tepirit Kanatami President Natan Obed for one of our online um, lunch discussions that we have a few weeks ago. Uh, he's the president of the National Inuit um, Association in Canada and he, you know, was drawing parallels between tuberculosis and COVID as this, um, sort of silent killer in communities and and he really stressed the point and I think um, a lot of people may feel the same way that that there's this hope that the crisis will draw attention to how awful that illness can be for communities across Inuit Nunangat and that we hope if if anything can come from this that there'll be empathy and maybe some some action um, Another point I wanted to, well, I guess it's more of a question for you. I, I, I wonder, I report in uh, Nunavik a lot, which is uh, the region of northern Quebec. It's 14 communities. It's it's much smaller than Nunavut, but comparable in a way. And I'm sort of looking at the responses to COVID in both. And I wonder, um, w with Nunavut being a territory, um, having some of its own sort of autonomy, um, compared to other Inuit regions in Canada, if that's helped it sort of make decisions for itself. Um, Nunavik has a small outbreak. I think there's been just over a dozen people and most of it's been focused in a community, um, but they haven't had the same um, success, I think, getting information out. It's harder because it's located in Quebec. The Quebec Premier is giving, you know, these daily press briefings as well, but they're largely in French. There's a little bit of distance. There can be a little bit of sort of distrust, I think, um, between communities in Nunavik um, and the Quebec government, um, just based on geography, language. Um, I wonder if um, you think Nunavut has done really well managing this um, because it's its own territory. And I guess at the root of that, you know, where communities can take charge um, of their own response if they're going to be more successful? Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I did mute myself. Uh, actually, I had the same question for you, Sarah, because I, I was wondering if, um, if Nunavik had the same 
um, you know, structure or same public health measures in place as Nunavik, you know, and as I was, I've mostly been following the coverage on Nunatsiaq, which I think is you <laughs> writing. And so, <laughs> and so, um, um, yeah, I just trying to wrap my head around what, um, uh, the difference might be between the two places and, you know, um, what their public health measures have been. Um, it's, it's difficult to compare, uh, with two different jurisdictions with different, um, regional, regional governments, I think, and provincial territorial governments involved. Yeah. And I think your point about when spring breaks were held, I mean, I think that, uh, that absolutely plays into it. Cause it's not, community transmission that we're seeing in Nunavik. It's it's people that were in southern Quebec that traveled back. And in, in the case of um, the infections in Provognatuk, it's largely um, members of uh, the same family, like not the same household, but sort of related. But uh, I don't know, I just, I guess I just see a, a bit more disconnect there. Um, one thing that Nunavik did do uh, early on, um, which I think was probably good for them is to decide to cancel the the school year, whereas um, now, as you've probably heard, Quebec, the rest of Quebec is moving ahead with opening elementary schools uh, in a couple of weeks, which is um, controversial, <laughs> I think, to say the least. Um, so yeah, I see, I see a, a little bit of a, a, a disconnect, I think, between you know the government is based in Quebec City, um, getting that information out. They they're not doing the same kind of um, they're not giving the same kind of access to journalists officials in Nunavik as, as it, which I think has an impact. Okay. From um, uh, our principal, Gwen, Natalie de Rosier, how are families managing with some of their members down south? Uh, is creating some issues for those who did not come back in time? Are people starting to debate the travel restrictions? Um, I, I haven't been exposed to any conversations where people have debated the travel restrictions. I, I've spoken to people who've undergone the quarantine um, in, in Ottawa and, uh, you know, for for everyone that I've spoken to, um, everyone recognizes that it's not ideal. You know, I don't think it's fun to be in quarantine uh, for two weeks. Um, I mean, all of the necessities are provided and groceries and food and things like that. But um, but nobody wants to be the person who brings COVID here. And so everyone that I've spoken to is willing to do it. You know, it may not be a joyful experience, but it is something that, um, you know, in my experience talking to people that people have been willing to do, you know, all the students who who um, were returning from school, you know, all went through quarantine and, um, you know, I have a, you know, a, a community member I was speaking to and one of my elders that I visited this morning, you know, they've all recently returned from medical travel and, um, you know, had to undergo the 14-day quarantine just so that they could attend a follow-up appointment in Ottawa. And, um, you know, it's it's not ideal, but it's totally necessary. And and no, no complaints have been sent in our direction um, about it. Not yet, anyway. I, I was hearing some questions put to Dr. Patterson, is it, the Chief Medical Public Health Officer? that uh, there's not enough rooms in the hotels in Ottawa that the territory is dealing with, so that there are people waiting to get into the hotel rooms and then having to wait for their two-week um, for their two-week isolation. And you're nodding as, as I'm talking, so you must have heard this too. Is there some issue whereby the territorial government isn't uh, arranging for enough hotel rooms to to move people through fast enough. You know, I'm not very familiar with their 
procurement processes. I would I would imagine it's um, probably more an issue re related to process and time the time it takes to develop all those agreements and protocols. I know that when you know we uh, as an organization have connections to hotels in Ottawa, for example, that. Um, reached us, reached out to us in March, and said, you know, if you have this need, we will we will provide it for you, um, you know, at our hotel in Ottawa, and and uh, specifically for anyone returning related to our organization, and you know, we didn't have that need, so we didn't follow up. But um, you know, I think in in general, the response has been supportive, and it's probably just uh, you know rules and procurement processes I you know I'm not familiar with their um, emergency response protocols in terms of what that looks like um, for acquiring hotel space but I'm sure there are people working on it yeah uh, a question from Catherine Fowler as we start to think about emerging from isolation in this crisis are there measures that none of it will take that might be different than we would see down south well, you've canceled dog sled races, for one thing. There aren't any dog sled races being canceled in the south. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think, you know, our public health measures have really encouraged people to get out, get out on the land and, um, and things like that. So already, you know, it looks a little bit different. Um, I... I I would imagine that it will be some time before people feel comfortable lifting the travel restrictions, even uh, just observing um, some of the, the dialogue around um, calling teachers back to work uh, last week. So um, where they closed the schools in, in mid-March for, for three weeks going into that, which would then lead into the scheduled spring break. Um, which which ended April 20th and and 14 days before that they they announced that teachers should return you know be prepared to, to return to work on April 21st and to develop learning packages for students and and so there was quite a bit of um, debate around that because um, I, I think about 10%, uh, last I saw a little less than 10% of our teaching population had left the territory with the closure closure of the schools and and some communities um, and DEAs had requested that those teachers not be asked to return because it wasn't worth the risk um, of them exposing you know students or families to COVID. So having observed that um, th that discussion in, in our communities, I I think that for us you know, where maybe in the South people are, are are looking forward to having travel restrictions lifted. I think here people will be hesitant um, to see those travel restrictions lifted until, um, until the case counts are lower in the South. So I, I, I'm just hypothesizing, but I, uh, seeing how things are right now, I would imagine that there would be more hesitation here. Uh, there's a question, can you comment on the impact of these restrictive measures on the local economy? Um, I don't know that I can, actually. <laughs> I, I think that... Um, I think that our biggest concern at first, uh, you know, and I we're just getting all of my... This is not <laughs> all of my, you know, conversations with people. Um, the biggest concern was around our food supply chain at first, you know, especially where, you know, Ottawa had run out of toilet paper and, you know, that's that's one of our big food mail provider centers and and that had caused panic here. But but, you know, our um, a lot of our goods, uh, you know, our, our dry goods and our, you know, shelf stable products, you um, come in on a sea lift every summer. So all the communities in Nunavut and our, you know, our grocery stores have a, a one year supply uh, that arrived last summer. And so, you know, our, it, for a number of 
items, you know, our stores have been well stocked and then they've they've switched to doing home deliveries and things like that. So I think in terms of the those big um, those big concerns for many people, they've been alleviated uh, for small businesses, you know, people who rely on um, on, um, you know, crafting income and craft sales and the arts communities, I, I would you know, uh, the performing arts, I, I believe that they, you know, will be facing more struggles um, under the current um, situation. Are you, um, are you going to get ship tourists wanting to come up to the territory? And, and, and how are, how are they going to be dealt with? Uh, well, the waters around Nunavut are closed, I believe, until September was the announcement. But uh, maybe Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> if you, if you um, have been following it, Sarah, but I, I don't believe they're going to allow ship traffic for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I did hear about a, a ban going for a certain number of months, but I couldn't say more than that. Yeah. yeah. When uh, when does the sea, when does the sea lift start? And is there any worries, concerns there about infection coming in? I I don't. Uh, so our sea lift starts um, well in northern Quebec. It's it's slightly earlier, but for us, uh, you know, the first ships arrive in mid July. And uh, for Echaluit, you know, as the capital, we have ships right through till October, um, coming and going on a regular basis. And I, I don't know what the concerns are around infection at this point um, at all. Uh, but we do, we definitely do depend on that sea lift. So uh, it will be something that everyone will be talking about. Absolutely. And and there's a, there's this is totally separate but there's a really awesome tv show on the discovery channel called high arctic haulers all about our sea lift and which i at first thought you know who's going to want to watch a show about sea lift boats <laughs> stuck in the ice for like a week at a time but uh but actually the show showcases all these beautiful stories and beautiful faces from around nunavut and it's it's just one of the most fantastic heartwarming shows it, and just shows actually also what we're waiting for to come off those boats <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty so good I actually it? yeah it's really good um so actually uh, i guess we're waiting to see what that decision around trip traffic means for sea lift but it, it is an essential service so hmm. rachel sarah I have a, a question. I, I don't know if you can answer it, but I just thought it was interesting. Um, Dr. Patterson, I believe that it was at yesterday's press conference, said that um, talking about the the decrease in the number of medevacs going out and that there was a drop in respiratory tract infections uh, across the territory, um, which suggests that, that this physical distancing is working. It's been effective. I mean, are there things to that we can take from this to implement longer term, or does that just seem completely unrealistic for um, communities in Nunavut? I I don't know. I it's it's a really interesting question, and you know, can we translate that into your argument around housing and health? You know, if people have more space, you know, or you know, are we reducing our risk of transmission of respiratory illnesses? You know, in the bigger context, um, you know, I think we have a lot of a lot of questions there um, that we we really look forward to to investigating. You know, here at the center, we we want to be looking into those um, unintended outcomes for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If uh, yeah. those of you those of you in the viewing audience are interested, the uh, CBC none of it. Uh, is is broadcast or live streamed on Facebook, and it's just I don't know what the roaring is, but uh, you can you can you can uh, 
you can access by just doing a CBC none of it search on Facebook and it comes up and you can link it ask them to notify you whenever they're broadcasting live and it's uh, the uh, press conferences are really really interesting I have one I guess question to sort of wrap things up or summarize it to ask you when um, I think in recognizing this as a very difficult time in crisis for many communities um, I think a lot of people academics, advocates, and organizations have come forth um, saying certain current disparities we see in in either re risk reduction, testing, infection rates, or or deaths from COVID um, more generally um, are, are driven by existing structural um, inequalities. And I think a lot of people have pointed out this need for, um, and that it's an opportune time now to plan for um, fundamental changes in how our societies operate and uh, like post COVID, um, like planning for the future after um, whatever post COVID means. Um, I don't know how to define that at this point, but I'm wondering if you see any um, using those kind of strengths based uh, approaches, what opportunities you see in, in this current situation um, on improving Inuit health and Arctic health more broadly? It's a great question. That is a great question. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're still trying to figure it out now that we're just coming down off our initial panic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, first, the first several weeks now we, you know, we're cultivating a space where we can critically think and think about and examine those, those questions. But that's absolutely the you know the space and the discourse you know we want to be part of and we want to be part of cultivating i think you know immediately um you know we can see you know the the changes to connectivity right so how people are using you know we we do have an internet infrastructure even though it's not adequate you know and how people are using it in creative ways uh you know for example um my daughter, who is 10, she and I participated in an Inuit embroidery um, workshop on Zoom, you know, last week, which which probably wouldn't have happened, you know, before that, or even that I would have considered connecting to it um, with our bandwidth caps <laughs> and things like that. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, are we expanding our ways to communicate and connect with each other like you know we were learning from an elder in Nunatsia but you know how wonderful is that so where exactly like you're saying where we can take um you know uh, some exceptional learnings and uh, and apply them going forward we are absolutely 110 percent excited to be in that in that space um you know as we go forward Gwen, is there just to follow up on Rachel's question? Is there a is there a post COVID conversation to be held in in none of it that that meshes with with uh, with Inuit values? I mean, can you see this as an opportunity of of going somewhere? Yes, I think I think that's I think that's going to happen. You know across the board, you know, for, for community organizations and, and territory uh, organizations, Inuit organizations, I, I think that, you know, and I'm hopeful that that will be the, actually the grounding for those conversations going forward. Um, and that, you know, that's the grounding for our work at all times at Kavi Gelti, and so we'll, we'll definitely be carrying that forward. Um, in our everyday work, as we always do here at the center. I think we're out of time. Gwen, thank you so much. Uh, it's been so nice of you to take this time to talk to us. And thank you, Rachel and, and Sarah. And, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Stay safe in the north.